turn it over to Ms. Cajule or okay, Ms. Cajule for introduction. Thanks. Thank you, Madam Chair. The purpose in developing a recreation and culture strategy is to design a plan that provides direction for the provision of high quality recreation and culture programs, services, and infrastructure for residents, as well as an implementation framework of priorities for the next several years. A significant engagement process took place throughout March and April of this year and gathered feedback from over 1,100 respondents, including residents in the region, community groups associated with recreation and culture, a youth survey, and a variety of meetings and discussions with stakeholders. Five overarching themes from the research and engagement plan um, emerged to guide the strategy development, and four big plays have been identified to further enhance the provision of recreation and culture in the community, which the consultant would, will speak to. So at this point, I would like to introduce RC Strategies, who will be joining us virtually. The company is one of a few professional consulting practices in Canada that specializes in recreation, parks, trails, and culture planning and policy development. They work with many government and non-government clients in the public services sector, and have previously worked with the Grand Prairie Regional Recreation Committee. I would like to welcome Mike Roma, Managing Partner, and Megan Carey, Senior Consultant, to present the City of Grand Prairie Recreation and Culture Strategy. Perfect. Thank you for that. Good afternoon and welcome. Thank you, Mayor Clayton and Councillors, for having us again today. Am I able to share my screen? Yeah, you bet. Thank you. As I say, thank you, Mayor Clayton and councillors and administration for welcoming us back today. We're pleased to be able to share with you the recreation and culture strategy that we have been working with administration on developing over the past year. Before we begin, uh, we would like to begin and start this meeting uh, in a good way and offer a land acknowledgement. Uh, Mike and I are joining you from Treaty 6 territory today but we do want to recognize the diverse Indigenous peoples who have called Treaty 8 home uh, and who are the original caretakers of the land. We do this to reaffirm our commitment to improve the awareness and recognition of Indigenous peoples, their rights, and their strong kinship to the land and water. Together, we can call upon our shared and collective traditions and spirit to work in building great communities together for today and for the future generation. Thanks, Megan. And uh, thanks, Mayor Clayton, members of council, members of administration for having us here today. As Stephanie mentioned, Mike Chroma and Megan and I will be obviously going through the presentation together. Uh, what that presentation looks like is we'll do a quick uh, welcome and introduction. So we'll explain to you again who's on our team and uh, who is involved in developing the strategy thus far, go through the purpose and the process, just to refresh uh, your memories about what's been done. We will be going through some of the higher level findings or uh, the salient findings from um, a bunch of research and engagement that we conducted. So we call that what we learned and then we're going to get into the actual draft recreation and culture strategy. So the structure of it, the foundations and the recommendations within it. Right, please. So um, we have had the opportunity to um, obviously get input from Council, uh, we also have had input from a number of city administrators, and we have a smaller formal team that we've been working with at the city, uh, which involves Ms. Casualty, uh, Ms. Bieberdorf. Uh, we also have on our team, on the consulting side, uh, we have an architecture firm called HCMA that we have at our disposal should the need uh, arise for technical expertise related to facilities or capital budget estimation. Not much of, of that is included in our presentation to you today yet, but if it does, we have the ability to do so. And then we also have a specialist in the arts and culture planning world called Lord Cultural Resources. They're based out of uh, Toronto and work internationally, and they've been integral in uh, helping us shape some of our, our recommendations and our analysis related to uh, the arts and culture or the culture part of the recreation and culture strategy. Hi, please. 
Um, this slide has a bunch of text on it, so apologize for that in advance, but we wanted to, to show you word for word what uh, we responded to when the terms of reference was sent out and um, you know what, what we've kind of formulated our, our work plan towards and what we, we hope to ultimately provide the city at the end of this recreation and culture strategy process. So some of the key points uh, related to this is it's about provision of these services, obviously not just infrastructure, but programs and, and services for residents and visitors. It's a 12 year or a 12 year plus time horizon. And you can see it's meant to deal with service levels, uh, geographic distribution, uh, addressing barriers. It's really about making, uh, building upon the successes that you already experienced related to recreation and culture in the city and enhancing or, or uh, getting to even more benefit from investing in those services, not just with current levels of uh, resources that you put into them, but potentially guiding you on how to uh, invest more should you decide to as a municipality. Um, very important for us to, to make sure that in developing a strategy like this, that we understand the current kind of landscape for recreation and culture services. So reviewing the current state. Um, part of that isn't just knowing, you know, utilization and participation of your facilities or talking to some of your community groups and, and members of your general public, but it's also supplementing that with uh, looking at leading practices or other practices in the industry that we're aware of. That's one of the values that a consulting team like us brings to uh, brings to the table, I guess, is that we've been involved in currently and, and in the past uh, similar planning processes across Canada. Uh, already mentioned, and, and Stephanie did a great job of giving an overview of the, the breadth of the community engagement that occurred. We put a lot of a lot of weight in the information that we get from your community, whether it's the public, members of, of your community groups, your volunteer community, or, or even other facets of the population like youth. Uh, recreation and culture doesn't, there isn't a legislation that guides municipalities on what kind of facilities or programs to provide. And obviously those, that investment that you make, that any municipality makes is in response to what we believe the, uh, the marketplace wants, so it's really important to hear from them. Um, once we were able to look at the inventory of your facilities and that trends information and community engagement, we have obviously had to interpret and analyze that, and that's what's ultimately led us to this draft strategy today. So with that, I'll pass it back over to uh, Megan to walk through some of our findings. Thanks, Mike. So focusing on those uh, top three elements that Mike just introduced, um, reviewing your current state, including the policy and planning framework, um, our extensive community engagement process um, that we conducted, which had over a thousand responses to the community survey, uh, in which we interviewed over 60 community groups, um, and then triangulating that uh, with our understanding of the sector um, and our understanding of, of municipal, other municipal comparables and, and how that might influence your provision. There's four, uh, four key themes that emerged uh, from that research, and that was community development, geographic distribution, data literacy, and investment prioritizing. And I'm going to uh, share some of those findings um, just as to refresh and to anchor uh, the strategy recommendations and outcomes that we'll be presenting to you in the next section. So community development, uh, you know, as of course, as you're all aware that Grand Prairie is not only a major service center for the region when it comes to the provision of recreation and cultural services, but your population is very young and, and it's diverse and it's growing. And so ensuring that we are contributing to a developing of a recreation and cultural sector that's going to be responsive to that growth, that's going to be supporting shifts in your population and those expectations of residents uh, was a key theme that emerged from, from our work. Um, and it really focused on ensuring that we were approaching the strategy and thinking about recommendations in a terms necessary to facilitate collaboration between your community partnerships and the, and the work of the city. 
um, and looking to where we can foster uh, further inclusion and further um, delivery of equitable opportunities and using recreation and culture as a medium for that. A part of our, our research focused on looking at um, your diversity demographics and understanding throughout the city your population at a more granular level. So when we're starting to think about investment and prioritization and, and location of facilities and what recommendations might shape around, we understand the demographic complexity of your city. And so part of that, uh, our team looked at our understanding of the benefits of recreation, uh, of the unique barriers uh, that some populations may face to participating in recreation cultural opportunities. And so we know that we can't look at just one facet of our identity. We have to look at, at different factors and how those intersect with each other and how that might uh, indicate um, the types of barriers or, or need that might exist for recreation. And so when we layer all those factors together, we're able to get a sense of different pockets of your community um, where certain populations might reside that might warrant uh, different interventions um, to ensure participation fully in recreation opportunities. So you can see here areas that are marked in red. Those would be areas that would be higher on what, what we call a demographic suitability model, um, indicating that those would populate areas that may warrant further consideration um, for the provision of recreation opportunities. Building off of that, a uh, key theme was geographic distribution. It was, as when Mike went over the purpose of the study, a key part of the terms of reference of this project. Um, and this is not something, of course, that's unique to Grand Prairie. A consideration of travel times um, is something that all municipalities consider and, and look at. Um, and so we want to ensure that there is a balance in our community. Uh, so we are providing opportunities for all to be active within our communities. Uh, working within the uh, engagement, what uh, one of the findings was that while there is a great trail network uh, within the city, uh, there was some gaps that did limit active transportation. So that was something um, that was highlighted to us and, and to think about and how people are able to access their facilities um, and what perhaps could be done when we're starting to think about recommendations to address that. Um, your residents certainly believe that geographic balance is a very important consideration when we're talking about facility investment. Um, and a, a key theme that comes through the research um, you know, as well as Russ articulated um, in our discussions that we had for this project was the co-location of community facilities. And that really touches on the fact thinking through of what we are grouping together of our community facilities. What benefits can we derive and, and enhance participation by ensuring perhaps thinking through that where a school may be located to a recreation facility. If they were closer together and children were able to walk, um, whether during school hours or afterwards to participate, that there's significant benefits that can be derived from that. As part of our mapping work, we did look to see what um, levels of access uh, for recreation opportunities. And we looked at this from an indoor facility perspective and an outdoor recreation opportunity perspective. For the indoor analysis, we looked at a 10 minute drive time within the city to identify how many different opportunities that your residents would have access to. And so we decided to group the facilities uh, along with, aligned with arenas, arts and culture, and then major recreation facilities. And what you can see is where those intersect uh, on the map are gray areas that residents who live within those areas would have a 10 minute drive time to all three of those opportunities. So I think this map really illustrates uh, the breadth of coverage that you do have um, and that there is within a drive time, uh, your residents do have access to a variety of amenities and opportunities. The outdoor uh, considerations, so this looked um, at uh, a variety of outdoor amenities um, and this is, could be something as structured as a baseball diamond to all the way to a tobogganing hill. Um, so a, a variety of types of amenities that, that are considered here. And, and what we did was looking at using this time a 15 minute walk distance. 
So outdoor amenities, we know that people are more uh, likely to walk to, to an outdoor opportunity, not necessarily drive. And so we can see in the red areas, um, those residents would be have access to 14 to 18 different amenities or different opportunities to participate in a recreation opportunity. Uh, and the orange, again, it would be a high level provision of opportunities. And it's the gray or white areas that would have less opportunity within their, within their neighborhoods to walk to an outdoor recreation opportunity. The third key theme um, was data literacy. And this is, is something that's very front of mind for the entire recreation uh, and culture sector at the moment. Uh, we know that the more information we have, the more informed decision-making we can have. And so typically what we are uncovering is that, well, there are some processes and you know most communities do have some level of understanding and have some data that they're collecting. It could be enhanced, and, and this is, is sector-wide. It's across most municipalities, and, and most are looking at the moment of how they can enhance that to further their, their understanding, um, as well as connecting with their community groups, because often our community groups have um, a variety of data that they're gathering, and, and we're not perhaps implementing that into our municipal decision-making. And, and by doing so, we can then ensure that we're making better decisions and having a whole more holistic understanding of our community. The last key theme was investment prioritization. So we know by looking um, at your current facilities and spaces that you do experience high levels of utilization. Uh, however, we know that our audience expectations, the user expectations are shifting as well as participation patterns. That was certainly something that was happening pre-COVID and, and we've seen that just accelerate itself. Um, and so we need to kind of be thinking strategically as to how we can future-proof our decision-making processes and our provision of facilities and investment of our resources to ensure that we are making the most of our investment and resources that we have. Um, so looking within this scope, uh, it really focused on um, what opportunities were there, looking for perhaps an enhancement of certain facilities, um, as well as looking to expand investment into potential grant opportunities to ensure that community organizations were able to address their challenges and to continue being uh, good working partners with the city and the developing of um, recreation and culture opportunities for residents. Um, and there were certainly various inputs that we gathered from the engagement and research process that helped shape um, the strategy recommendations around investment and identifying uh, future direction. And so with that, I will hand it over to Mike to introduce the strategy document. Thanks, Megan, and, and thanks for uh, uh, hearing us out. We wanted to give you uh, just a, a little taste of, again, the breadth of information that we gathered that's informed uh, where the, the draft strategy is. Right now, um, you'll see as we start to talk about specific recommendations, we also have uh, a few other highlights related to maybe survey results or, or trends information and so on. And um, unfortunately, we can't share all of that background information with you because it, it represents hundreds of pages, but we thought again that uh, what Megan just went through and, and uh, I think they're on light blue boxes that you'll see in a few slides that those are the key things we wanted to uh, to make sure we explained uh, drove the the recommendations and actions that we're expecting uh, the, the strategy to to push forward with so in terms of the actual document because at the end of the day you will receive or uh, we will finalize a, a draft document that you've already received i just wanted to explain what uh, what that structure looks like so the beginning of it, kind of like this presentation, starts with an overview of, of what uh, the strategy actually is and why we would need one as a municipality, as the city of Grand Prairie. We'd also obviously want to summarize as much of the background information that we, we gathered and, and set the planning context the best we can. And that's in Grand Prairie today and in the play-by-play. -play. And as you see, some of these uh, the, some of the terminology we've used to, to name different sections in the reports meant to be uh, kind of approachable and representative of the subject matter that, that we're trying to, to tackle here, recreation and culture, uh, keep it uh, a bit uh, playful, digestible, and um, I guess easy for a variety of, 
of audiences to to review and understand because we think that's important too. All those gives administration and council guidance. We do think that the more that your community, your community groups, even the general public can familiarize themselves with this document when it's completed and kind of use it to guide maybe their own participation or their own volunteer commitments, I think the better off the entire region and, and city will be. So um, just like the structure of this presentation uh, and just just like uh, where we're, where we're going to head right away here, which is right to the, the draft recreation and culture strategy, we tried to bring the audience or the reader along in the same way that we are with uh, council administration today. Next slide, please. So what I'm going to talk about first is uh, what we've called the route to recreation and culture. And that's really kind of the philosophical underpinnings of, of recreation and culture service in the city. It's really meant to answer two different questions. One is why you invest in recreation and culture services. So obviously it's for the benefit that, you know, you get to see and, and all of the good things that happen from, from having a vibrant recreation and, and culture community. Uh, it, or sorry, having vibrant recreation culture in your community, but it's it's rare that a a municipality or um, or even some of the stakeholders within it can articulate what you know why that investment is so important. So we've attempted to do that here, and then we've also attempted to answer how uh, the city can go about providing those recreation and culture services through a set of principles and actions. Next slide, please. So first off, in a strategy like this, uh, we, again, do like to answer why it's a, a, a valuable investment in the community, and that typically starts with something called a vision. So I won't read that uh, word for word for you, but this is the draft vision that we've developed, or the vision, sorry, that we've developed for the recreation and culture strategy, again, based on triangulating all of that background information. and. Uh, just as a reference point, the closest thing that the city has right now in play related to a vision for recreation or recreation and culture is uh, from the 2016 Regional Recreation Plan. And we just put that up on the screen just so you can see how those two relate, but that this for the city is kind of bespoke to the city and includes recreation and culture. Right, please. We've also included a purpose statement, and I will read that one. It's to foster collaboration and inspire physical and creative participation. And that's something that, um, even though it can be top of mind for decision makers at a council table, it can very much so help to, to drive and focus uh, your administrative staff and those on the front lines of, of delivering of, of your part, I guess the city's part of delivering recreation and culture services. So it's, again, just to make sure that we remain on the same page as we're uh, delivering these services and that we know it's really about physical and creative participation. I know it's intuitive, but uh, in some ways it's good to have it documented and, and that's what we think should be in the strategy. Um, the next slide here talks about the guiding principle. So this is getting into not, not why we deliver the services, but how we go about delivering the services. And you can think about about these principles as maybe lenses that you would look through as you're making decisions and as your admin is actually uh, providing the services, making sure that uh, our facilities and our programs are inclusive, that we think about the environment, um, that we think about you know sustainability and, and cost, that we're still innovative and we're resilient, that we're remaining relevant, understanding our market, and we do we do all of that while working with our with our partners and, and with community. So a lot of really, um, I think, important words or important concepts to think about as you move forward delivering recreation and culture services and not necessarily that far off where maybe some of your previous strategic planning is or some of your bro broader strategic planning the city has in place, but definitely uh, presented in a way that's more maybe more relevant or focused on recreation and culture. Um, so that's the, the route to recreation. Uh, it's uh, about the how and the why, uh, but we also have a number of uh, kind of recommendations and uh, outputs or outcomes rather that 
uh, objectives that we've developed to kind of, uh, again, focus and think about the specific things that, that we could do as a city to, to make things even better than they are right now. So those are all organized in, into five themes. And uh, those themes are community capacity, equitable opportunities, innovation, investment, and community celebration. And all of the, I guess, direction that we're providing is organized under those five themes. And on the next slide, you can see that there are a number of uh, objectives, again, organized under those five themes, actions that are kind of like specific tactical recommendations, and then four big plays, which are the more significant uh, kind of bigger shifts or um, uh, elements of the strategy we thought deserve to even be brought forward in presentations like this uh, so that we remember as we implement the strategy at a minimum, we hope to see those, those big plays materialize. So with that, I'll pass it over to uh, Megan to actually start to go through a couple of the themes. Thanks, Mike. Um, so the first theme, as, as Mike had mentioned, is community capacity. And this really focuses on building excellence um, within your the city delivered recreation and cultural opportunities, um, but also about creating vibrancy within the community um, and ensuring that we do have a, a strong um, support system for our community groups who are supporting the delivery of recreation and culture in the city, um, but also that we have opportunities for collaboration between them and, and, the, and the municipality um, in which we can work together to create synergies, to build on our unique shared perspectives and find solutions uh, that make the most of our resources. And so building on our, our three objectives that, that we have outlined within the strategy document, um, we do have 13 action items that are focused uh, within this theme and supporting of those three management tools and or framework. And so our actions are tactical actions that are providing um, some initial direction to administration as to how they're gonna begin to implement this uh, these objectives really focus on fostering and supporting resource sharing. So working both internally uh, with, you know, with other supporting departments to gather information um, and to foster greater collaboration, um, but to also work with our community groups um, and other community partners uh, to ensure that we are sharing resources to overcome uh, potential barriers, uh, to share knowledge, uh, and to share insight into the community to make sure that we are making our recreation approachable and accessible to all. Um, key recommendations within uh, this theme also relate to the arts and culture sector. Uh, so a key finding from the work that Lord did was looking at the provision of arts and culture and considering the management model, but really importantly, the delivery roles for the cultural sector um, and to determine the best approach uh, for the city, but also for the local arts and culture sector. Um, so we ensure that we are, have, uh, are working towards shared goals and, and collective outcomes. We want to ensure that um, also we're supporting our volunteers within the community. We know how critical they are to the delivery of recreation and cultural opportunities. So ensuring that we are finding ways to streamline volunteer services uh, to provide, um, ensure that people are aware of the opportunities that there are to currently to volunteer. Um, and of course, really important that recognition so, so volunteers understand how well that they are valued and the important role that they play within our delivery system. Uh, part of this as well is looking to, you know, build on the city capacity, ensuring that we're, uh, you know, looking to our different procedures and policies that they are helping to make the most of resources um, that we have. One of the key recommendations um, in this section looks to the development of a community group recognition policy. And that really focuses on um, creating some structure around 
the you're working with the community groups um, and the gathering of their data. So getting back to that data literacy piece as well, but ensuring that we're we're adding some structure so we are aware of our community group. So when you go through a planning, even a planning opportunity like this, you know who you need to talk to, uh, but you get a sense of the facilities that they're using, the number of registrants that they might have, and it just provides, um, you know, a stronger network um, and a stronger relationship between your community groups and the city. Um, and it will benefit both uh, administration and your community groups. Additionally, within the sec sec section, we do look um, at a program development framework. So focusing on um, looking at decision-making around the provision of programs, particularly new programs. Uh, the city certainly does provide some of those programs, but we need to work with other service providers. And so the tool uh, provides a, a, a framework to think about how and when the city should be providing um, recreation programming. Uh, and the third is a community lens framework, which provides um, administration with a tool to think um, holistically about a decision make as a, de a particular decision related to a policy or a program um, or a service delivery uh, to ensure that we are thinking potentially about our own biases and also thinking through any unintentional barriers that might exist. So we are uh, making sure that we are supporting all of our community members in an equitable manner. Um, and then for each of the community capacities, we do uh, certainly provide uh, an outcome. And within the implementation component of the document, we do speak to pot potential metrics that can be used to ensure that we are building to meeting this outcome. Um, and within this theme, you know, it, it could be a metric, for example, of um, an increase in volunteer retainment and recruitment would be one kind of measure that we could use to see how we are, are moving along that pathway to meeting this eventual outcome. Obviously, when I, I was talking about that theme of community capacity, uh, I said partnership a lot. Uh, partnerships are, are key to recreation and culture. Um, they are, are valued members of our community um, and they certainly do enhance the benefits that communities, your community members will feel. We know that our partners are often on the front lines of recreation and culture service delivery and therefore can provide some really important insights to uh, our municipal decision-making process. However, like, like many of us, they have been certainly challenged by COVID and, and so it's really important uh, that we continue uh, from a municipal perspective to think about how we can best support and work collectively and collaboratively with our community partners to ensure that we are meeting um, shared goals. And so for each of the big plays, we do have some unique recommendations um, that fit within these um, and then also some supporting implementation guidance. Uh, so a key recommendation for partnerships um, in terms of fostering that collaboration and, and to foster knowledge sharing and, and capacity building is to organize an annual symposium that would bring together uh, your group, uh, not-for-profits in the community, and other valued collaborators and, and contributors to the recreation and culture world, world uh, to explore topics of interest, uh, to provide workshops for education and professional development, and then just to support that sector-wide relationship building, so to hear from each other um, and to, to share knowledge and learn from each other. Um, and the second uh, key recommendation would be to standardize partnership agreement forms. Um, and that just ensures that we've got some clear expectations around both roles from the municipal perspective, but then also the partners are aware of their roles as well. Um, and this can certainly set out some expectations around data collection and reporting and other basic criteria that's going to support um, and providing some transparency and understanding around the relationships moving forward. The second theme um, is equitable opportunities. And so equitable opportunities is, is about ensuring that our facilities, our spaces and programs are welcoming and accessible. Uh, to all future and current um, populations within our community. Uh, and this is something that was, you know, for me, if I was thinking what made this planning process unique, uh, 
was something. We really heard in the engagement process when we were working and speaking with different community groups and, and through our residents, how important this was and how important it was that we're, we were creating inclusive opportunities and, and, and equitable programming for your, your residents. And I think it really speaks to, to that if we look at 94% of your residents responded that it's important to show, ensure that recreation and culture opportunities are available and accessible to all residents in the community. So that was nearly all residents um, agreed with that statement. And so it was really unique and certainly allowed us um, to really uh, think through how, how we could shape this plan and shape our, our objectives and our supporting actions in a manner that was going to uh, facilitate that and, and move this forward. Um, the equitable opportunities theme contained um, 11 action items uh, and one management tool. And so our action items really focused on supporting the delivery of community-led programming, so allowing community groups and organizations to develop programming that was going to meet the needs uh, and, and foster unity within the community. Um, it was to ensure that we were also working with community partners um, who may work with equity-deserving groups um, to ensure program delivery uh, was happening, and that could be through public agencies um, and other not-for-profit organizations who you know, are really working day-to-day -day with, with these certain community members and perhaps could provide some additional insight. Um, we wanted to look, we also have actions that are really focused on working with, with schools as well um, to help to understand potential opportunities that might be there or potential gaps within the municipal service delivery to best support youth and ensure that they were, were participating and that they were getting the most benefit from your investment in recreation. And in terms of, of within the arts and cultural space to, to ensure that we were providing you know, affordable, creative spaces uh, to foster new artists. The, um, this particular theme also focused and captured the concepts of uh, geographic distribution, uh, in which it includes a site selection framework, so the importance of thinking through um, the different benefits that we want to get from, from a project um, and how it might be best suited within the community. Uh, so there are, you know, different criteria that are outlined and then weighted um, to allow uh, for an objective and transparent measurement of an analysis of potential sites for future investments. Um, this, the theme also speaks as well to enhancing um, community engagement and, and particular leadership training for st staff to increase that knowledge um, and capacity that we have um, within um, our management and, and administration within the city. So again, we have our, our outcome, and as I mentioned previously, there's certainly uh, metrics that are measured for each of, of those actions um, to help to measure and, and guide us on that road path forward. Uh, our second big play focuses on reconciliation and inclusion. And so we really here focus um, in thinking through how we can best structure our delivery of recreation and cultural opportunities that is going to enhance our community cohesion, um, our, our community pride as well, um, and support our inclusion and cross-cultural understanding and appreciation of each other. Um, this, this leads with reconciliation, uh, and that's you know a key a key element of this, and something that came through quite strongly in our engagement. But also, is really key in our sector right now is that is understanding how recreation can be used to really strengthen bonds with our indigenous community with community members, uh, indigenous peoples living in our community. That we can use recreation and culture as a way to develop shared understanding um, and shared pride. As so we know, that many um, recreation and cultural departments in Canada have also adopted statements related to equity, diversity, inclusion, and reconciliation, and that filters into their hiring practices, to staff education, and skill development. 
And certainly um, when we consider how the city's diverse population is growing, we feel that this is going to be incredibly important as we're moving forward uh, to future ready, the delivery of recreation and culture in Grand Prairie. And key recommendations focus on, again, uh, recognizing national truth and reconciliation and moving forward, uh, offering staff education and training programs, reviewing our existing policies with an equity lens, uh, and work to address opportunities where feasible, uh, and to conduct accessibility audits on, on our recreation and cultural facilities and spaces, um, and work that into our long-term asset management plans to address any deficiencies um, where determined feasible and appropriate. And so with that, I'll hand it over to Mike to speak to the third theme of innovation. Thanks, Megan. So innovation uh, in today's context in a recreation and, and culture, from a recreation and culture perspective, really just focuses on a couple of things. One is data collection. Uh, we traditionally, and I say the Royal, we, Megan and I, are part of a broader recreation and culture community across Canada, I would say, or even broader than that. And we don't do a good enough job of, of collecting good data and, and using it to, to make decisions. Um, so it's about getting better data and using it better. And it's also about the use of technology. Um, many of you can, can speak from experience that technology is a bigger part of, of your life than it was even five or 10 years ago. And that you can say the same thing for recreation and culture and different types of activity, delivery, and so on. So it does focus on those two things. I would also say that in the innovation section, we are focusing on how recreation and culture can, can actually be a medium or a tool to achieve some, some broader strategic directions that you might have as a, as a municipality or as a community that in, in years past, you might not, you might not think of the relevance of recreation and culture in, in those lenses. And you'll see what I mean, I think, in the big play related to innovation. So you can go to the next slide, please. So as it relates to uh, the actual action items that are included in the, in the strategy, so the more detailed kind of tactical things, there's six different action items in the innovation theme. And again, they really do focus on standardizing the collection of, of data, making sure that that data is in the, the right hands or in front of the right kind of decision makers or, or groups that, that could benefit from it. Um, and also making sure that our facilities and our spaces are equipped in a way that uh, enables the, the users to, I guess, use technology to benefit from technological advances in a recreation and culture context the best that they that they can. So the next slide uh, outlines the, the actual outcome related to innovation. You can see it's innovative, adaptive, and resilient. Those are the key terms there. And the next slide after that talks about the big play. And this is where we've, we've kind of shown that recreation and culture can have a part to play in some bigger conversations that, that may be Again, uh, historically, we haven't we haven't thought about. So, for instance, as it relates to climate change and environmental sustainability, we know that our, our recreation and culture facilities consume a lot of uh, of, of resources, utilities, uh, heat, power, water. Um, we also know that climate change is is very important to municipalities. It's very important to other levels of government, and it's very important to our to our general population. So as it relates to climate change and environmental sustainability, there are some things that the city has underway already, like the facility profiles and looking maybe more critically at the, at the facility assets the city manages and, and what opportunities there might be for enhancement or climate mitigation. So from a rec and culture perspective, we're saying that that's, that's bang on. That's exactly what, um, what we think should be happening and obviously just reiterating that recreation and culture should be part of that and continue to be part of that, that citywide process. We also thought that there might be an opportunity for you from a recreation and culture perspective specifically to report on some of that, that call it utility consumption that's happening at your facilities and your spaces and um, talk about to the general public, to your residents, what types of uh, maybe mitigation strategies you have or enhancements, and then report back on those. And it does tie into some of the 
uh, performance metrics, I think that Megan has alluded to already in the implementation, but there's a pretty exciting story to, to tell once you, once you make some of your facilities more efficient. And it can also filter into maybe people thinking about their own assets, their own buildings, their own homes, and, and maybe uh, provoke action at a, at a more personal or household level. So that's our big place for innovation. Uh, theme four is about investment and investment really handles or, or includes the infrastructure part of the recreation and culture strategy. And I know one that's, that's very relevant and important to, uh, to many residents. So um, it's about providing high quality and sustainable infrastructure, making sure you have the policy framework in place to uh, enable access um, fees, allocations, those kinds of things. There's five action items here and two management tools. Probably the most important storyline is on the next slide. Go ahead, Megan. <clears throat> that there's there's a number of phases that go into infrastructure development, and it's a major investment for a municipality. And we've outlined in the strategy some of those phases or, or steps that you take in actually getting to a decision point and then moving forward and actually seeing something materialize. So first off, there's an identification of need, either through the recreation and culture strategy that's happened now, or maybe when a group comes forward or a, a resident comes forward and says, we would like this kind of infrastructure or this kind of space in our community that we don't have or we don't have enough of. Then there's uh, the need for the city to look a little more critically at whether there is an actual need for that type of amenity or not, and how it would sit in terms of prioritizing against the other areas or potential amenities that you can invest in as a city. And we have some thoughts as to how to do that. If uh, investment seems like it might be warranted after that more critical look, of needs assessment and prioritization, then there's a more detailed level of study that's usually called feasibility or business case planning, which in the case of the strategy, we've outlined that there could be a few amenities that you could undertake that kind of planning in, but it's really just giving decision makers the information that they need to, uh, or that you need, I guess, to uh, decide whether or not uh, we can afford, whether something's actually feasible and warranted or not moving forward. So phase four is about that decision-making. Hopefully the feasibility and business case plan planning uh, provides you that information. And if you decide to move forward, then it, you get into design and construction. So the next slide has a list of indoor and outdoor amenities that we've assessed based on that, you know, kind of uh, based on the initial phases of that, that process that I just spoke to. And the indoor amenities that we think you may uh, consider investing in or improving these service levels in are listed there. More specifically, we've suggested that event hosting facilities, indoor fields and performing arts may warrant going to that next feasibility or business case planning step. And we realize that in those three areas that there's either ongoing work or there has been work in the past. So it's building upon that, that good work that the community or that the city's already done. And then on the outdoor side, you can see there's four different amenities that could be considered for enhancement. Again, all of those would be privy to those steps that were outlined in the previous slide. Go to the next slide, please. So again, the outcome here is about making sure we have uh, the facilities, the infrastructure in place to, to let recreation and culture influence quality of life. Back to you, Meg. Thanks, Mike. Our final theme uh, that we are presenting on is community celebration. And this really focuses on providing that right mix of amenities to host sport, art and cultural events, uh, and also to think about the provision of these opportunities that are gonna foster community pride that um, are going to build on our cohesive community spirit as well uh, and focus on hosting events that are for the community as well as events that may be of larger scale uh, that then tie into those elements of economic development, of tourism, uh, and building our, our reach as a region and attracting visitors to our community. So within uh, this section, we have nine action items uh, and one management tool. 
And so these, uh, the action items within this section focus on the building on our existing strategies that we have, such as the 2012 Sport Tourism Strategy, but also to think through where other potential um, policies and procedures that we could be developing and fostering so we are moving forward uh, in, a, in a cohesive strategic direction. This section also focuses on communication elements. So we heard, you know, we learned through our engagement process that uh, not knowing or an unaware of opportunities was a significant barrier to participation. So what can we do? What can you do as a municipality and the administration look to combat that? So really focusing on you know, developing something as tactical as an e-newsletter is one of the recommendations within this section. Um, and we could ensure that user groups are included in that. The, the management tool for this particular uh, theme focuses on providing you with a template for a communication plan. So it's a communication plan that could be shared with your groups, um, and they would then have to be sending in, in a standardized manner, their information that could be included in your newsletter or to be shared on social media. The other key uh, element in this as well is focuses on uh, looking to create new pathways to share feedback. So how perhaps could we a bit, be a bit innovative um, in gathering feedback from our residents and community groups in new ways. The big play um, associated with this theme is event hosting. And so we know that this um, is, is a significant importance uh, for Grand Prairie. When we talk about event hosting, it's certainly um, an economic generator for municipalities. But hosting events is a really significant way to draw people into our new communities, into our communities who may not have visited before. It's a way to show off um, our municipal values and pride. Um, it's a way to, to leverage uh, these opportunities to further our volunteer training and development. Um, and so really this, this section focuses on taking um, a more cohesive view of our event hosting so that it's not necessarily we're focusing just on sport or just on culture, but really trying to, to move that dial forward to thinking about sport, recreation, art, and culture as one. However, we do know it is important uh, as we're starting to think about event hosting um, to make sure that we're doing it with a resident first approach. So we are thinking um, that when we're talking about event hosting or we're looking to pursue the hosting of, of larger events that we're thinking through, um, how that is going to impact our residents long term and how that can be leveraged to best support them. The key recommendations relating to this big play focus on the development of an event hosting strategy. Again, that's going to hopefully capture those synergies between the different events. Focus on continuing uh, the hosting of community events, so those the some smaller community level events. We know we've seen great growth in those. Uh, 2022, this year had the highest level of community events, uh, even higher than you know pre-COVID in 2019. Uh, and we want to ensure that we are creating some outcomes. So we're thinking strategically about economic, social, and environmental outcomes as it relates to event hosting, so that we can make sure that we are working collaboratively with our other municipal departments who are focused on events, as, as well as our key community pro, uh, partners, uh, not-for-profits and, and groups who are supporting um, event hosting and the delivery of those events. So a few next steps. Um, the document will be shared for internal and external review with the public. Following that review and, and any identified revisions, the strategy would be adopted by council and administration. Uh, and we would work with administration to develop implementation workshops uh, in which we'll be able to further um, flesh out some of these details and make sure that we're, we're working with you uh, in an innovative and approachable manner. And so with that, I would open it up to any questions you may have. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you for that. Uh, I have a couple of people in the queue. Uh, first, go to Councillor Blackmore. Well, thank you for your presentation today. I think that um, you gave us a lot more meat um, so that we can have a good look at this. Um, I'm just questioning your big play that is connected to truth and reconciliation. Um, I feel that 
um, as a city, we've done a lot of work with truth and reconciliation uh, to date. And uh, what I'm more concerned about is the fact that I don't feel we are particularly inclusive uh, with a lot of other ethnic groups in the community uh, speaking, for example, uh, what do we do to ensure that our Muslim population is welcomed to all of our sporting facilities or, or our uh, um, Islamic population? You know, we have a, a wide variety of people who live in Grand Prairie that I feel we're not providing a warm welcome to. And I would be much happier to see the big play address that on a broader scale rather than focusing on indigenous populations where I feel we've already made significant headway. That's a, a very good point, uh, Councillor, uh, through the mayor. And I guess part of our presentation here might have insinuated that it is more of a focus on reconciliation, but um, I would just uh, maybe confirm or clarify that when, when we talk about reviewing some of those policies and thinking about accessibility audits for facilities, it definitely is meant to include not just uh, Indigenous populations, but all equity-deserving groups. So, I mean, in the fine print, you would see that. ...and recruitment of volunteers. Is that the theme or in this big play? Is that part of it, the volunteer side? Thank you, Councillor, through the mail. Uh, Mayor, yes, that within the partnership piece, that big play, um, certainly volunteers are captured in that. Um, we do have more targeted action recommendations within the first theme of community capacity that speak directly to volunteerism. Um, and again, some uh, innovations and some leading practices or, or success stories of other communities would be included in the what we learned component. Perfect. Thank and you. And it, it is just about, okay, thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, Councillor Bressy. Great, thank you. I'm just curious what role, what consultations happen with the sport connection in this and if there's thought yet about how much is this going to be the city's doing it and how much is the sport connection going to be doing this on our behalf? Yeah, I can, I can handle that one first, Megan, if you okay. want. Uh, thanks, uh, Councillor Bresci, through the mayor. Um, so Sport Connection was one of the uh, contributors, I guess, community contributors to our planning process. And we do know that the Sport Connection plays a, a fairly significant role in the delivery of some of these things. Like even when we talk about building community capacity, we know that, that they already do some of that for sports groups. Um, but also that their focus is specifically on on sport, and that this is a bit broader. So um, we were we were important. It was important for us to articulate. I don't know if you picked up on it, but even when I started talking about the the philosophy part of of the strategy, that we we reiterate that this isn't just for the city. Even though you've commissioned this this uh, kind of document or planning process to happen, we do hope that it gets that it's consumable, that it's uh, digestible or understood by the broader community. And Sport, Sport Connection is, is obviously going to be able to see and, and understand this, but even some of the volunteer groups that you have, because it, there are, um, in order to, to get to a better place, uh, it, that can't just be on the city because the delivery of, this, of these services right now isn't, isn't just on the city. So we haven't been so bold as to say, this recommendation should be led by Sport Council or anybody else other than the city at this point in time. But that might be something that happens a little bit later on in the next step when we uh, talk with staff about actual implementation, like actual on the ground furthering some of these recommendations. And I'm, I'm assuming that at that point, there would be a target put on Sport Council, just like there might be targets put on other community partners to help uh, push, push some of these things forward. Great. No, that's good to hear because I know, for example, there's talk about integrating cultural events as triad days. The Sport Council did that their last triad day. You could go and you could do art for it. My kid did painting instead of a sport last triad day. And the annual symposium, there's an every two-year symposium that they organize where maybe we get more done by giving them a couple thousand dollars so they can do that every year instead of us creating something else this annual and maybe there's potential expanded. So I'm glad to hear there's that conversation going on. 
Councillor Berg. Thank you, Mayor Clayton. So mine is actually kind of a spinoff of uh, Councillor Bressy's, at a coincidence. So, but mine is more private sector. Um, when I look at the list of things, there are a few areas that I see that would be more private sector focused than public sector and possibly, um, I don't know, an economic opportunity. So I guess, do you plan on elaborating or flagging what traditionally would be public sector versus private sector? As we all know, golf courses and bowling alleys are, are easy to identify as, as private sector sports and rec. Um, but some of these we're not as familiar with. So is that something that you plan on flagging for us? Great question, uh, Councillor Strew, the mayor. So <clears throat> we haven't necessarily suggested what, you know, we think in terms of amenity development or provision or program provision is specifically something that the private sector should look at or post-secondary should look at or the city should look at. But we have provided a framework uh, for for the city to consider when needs are outstanding for programs or for different types of activities, how you might tackle uh, going about filling that need. And, you know, in a nutshell, it's really about in order to lever the limited investment the city has, it's really about hoping that or letting the nonprofit and the private part of the recreation and culture community provide everything that they can so that you can use your limited resources in areas where there isn't as much interest. And private sector interest and nonprofit interest happens for a variety of ways. It doesn't happen because the city says you should provide this. It happens because there's a, you know, somebody that's passionate in front of a, uh, let's just say a disc golf uh, opportunity. And if you don't have that passion, then maybe you don't, that's when the city would actually have to, to look at uh, getting its hands dirty. So it's not, I, I, would, I would offer to say in recreation and culture, it's probably not as simple as having a list of amenities that the city would provide and that the private and the nonprofit sector would provide. It's almost a little bit more organic in that sense where you, you listen to the community, you do your research and you identify maybe areas for enhancement or need. And then, uh, like I said, I, I don't maybe hope's not maybe the right word, but you leave it to the nonprofit and private sector where at all possible, so that you can focus your limited resources elsewhere. Yeah, thanks. So perhaps this research that we make public, um, those private nonprofit uh, operators may see opportunity in that. So thank you. Hundred percent. That's exactly what we hope would happen. Very, very astute. Thank you. Thanks for that, Councillor Plot. Uh, thanks, Mayor Clayton. Uh, thanks for the report. I'm just kind of building off of Councillor Berg's. Um, I'm just wondering if you have models for what three Ps could look like for soccer clubs or volleyball clubs or uh, different associations that may want to come forward. And my, and my reason for asking is it's nice to think that, you know, we'd like to work with them, but it's nice to have a framework to start with for these, for these agencies if they did want to come in and help what that could look like. So is there any models that you could provide um, that would show us a path towards that? I'll try this one too, Meg, and then maybe I'll let you have the next one. <laughs> I don't mean to hog all the questions. Uh, to the councillor, through the mayor, um, part of the policies that we spoke about uh, or our policies and procedures around partnerships would, I think, handle that. So there was the uh, forms that were mentioned, and uh, we've also highlighted that that could be an area of policy development for the city. There really isn't... Uh, kind of a one size fits all for those kind of partnerships that come forward. And again, just like the passion behind different types of programs or opportunities, it really depends on the strength of maybe the potential partner bringing the opportunity forward and their experience in either operations, capital funding, and, and so on. So what we're suggesting is that A, partnerships are important so that you shouldn't, you know, you should always uh, keep your door open for those opportunities to come forward. It doesn't mean you as a municipality would fund all um, in a more consistent fashion than maybe you have in the past or in other municipalities where we've seen partnerships used uh, more than what you have. We, we know that there are pros and cons to having those partnerships in place and we've tried to equip you with the tools that we think would 
would ensure there's more pros than than cons when partnering to provide recreation and culture services. Okay. All right. Thank you. I'm just going to jump in uh, on the same vein here. Um, possibly a question for you or for administration. I'm curious why on the access to opportunities on the indoor map, we don't identify the four facilities that we partnered with the school boards on. We have um, cultural centers as well as uh, community gyms and they're not labeled on those maps. And I was curious if there was a reason or it's just it was intended to be solely owned uh, city facilities. I, can, I can't see if, uh, if Steph's got her mic on there or not, but I can answer that when when we, uh, the mayor through yourself, um, when we ask about um, about inventories of facilities and talk about specific places and spaces and plans like this, we typically default to the ones that you as a municipality have control over. So it's uh, it's important uh, to consider the other ones, and I think that would be. Uh, uh, a friendly amendment maybe to add another version of that map that includes those. But if um, if there are elements or assets like that that aren't included, it's probably because of our, our default uh, request um, when we embark on a project like this. Okay, yeah, just a sort of a, a comment. Uh, previous councils were um, very f focused and had intent with the facilities that they did partner with the school boards on. Uh, there's one in each quadrant of our city, um, two being culturally focused and two being recreational fo focused. And, and on that map, in my opinion, they fill out some geographical areas where it looks like there isn't emphasis in culture or recreation. So in my personal opinion, those would be, um, it would be valuable to add those. Councillor Bressy. Great, thank you. Um, I'm just, uh, uh, I guess, I guess it's more a comment, and then I've got a question that's slightly related. But I think one comment I've got is we're looking at getting closer to a final strategy. Is I would personally love to see a bit more emphasis placed on facilities we don't currently have in our community. And for me, I think we're getting to be a big enough city, and we're getting enough trouble attracting people here that we really should be a place where. Pretty much any reasonable recreation desire you have, you should be able to do here. Obviously, you're not going to be able to scuba dive in Grand Prairie, but a great example is... You can. You can. <laughs> yeah. It's true. You can. You can. Um, yeah. But it's... Uh, yeah, you can't, you can't elephant hunt here. <laughs> but we could if we really wanted to invest in it. But anyways, my so a great example is a climbing wall right now. I think that a climbing wall should be a higher priority for us than something similar because you can't climb here and there's families that won't live here because they can't climb here. I think two years ago, pickleball, I think, should have been, it was a high priority for our council because people want to play pickleball and you couldn't play pickleball here. And I think that there is something about having a facility that's not here that should prioritize it a little bit more than other facilities. So that's a bit of a comment. Um, but related to this, I'm trying to think there's a few projects that I'm hoping to advance and I hope the council's hoping to advance. One of those is a climbing wall, uh, but the other one is the Avondale school site. We've got some recreation we need to replace there. And I'm curious in terms of process and if a, if a councillor wanted to advance projects, but also respect the strategy, respect this plan, how does this set us up to do that? Kind of what's our next step to actually start moving towards investment? I'm going to turn that thank to... Thank you, Councillor. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, thank you, Councillor, through the Mayor, for your question. Uh, excellent question um, and certainly something that we've considered and, and is certainly um, important. And I think the investment prioritization tool probably sets you up best and provides you with a framework to start thinking about if you were to advance, wanting to advance a project, to best think about that. So your example of you know, if you can't prove to do a certain activity in Grand Prairie, well, that is part of, of the investment prioritization tool where if the amenity is currently not available or the space is not available in Grand Prairie, then it would actually, it would score itself quite high. Um, or as particularly building on that, if the amenity or, or opportunity was not in the region as well, that would help to score that opportunity higher than, say, 
uh, a baseball field because we know that you have quite a few baseball fields. So, so that uniqueness, that aspect of trying to find unique opportunities and, and to ensure that you are on the forefront of, of development um, is built into that tool. Um, so I think working within the investment prioritization, but also importantly working within the site selection framework as well to help think through some of those partnerships to think through where it's going to be best situated in the city in terms of supporting future growth um, are two important elements that can provide you with some initial structure as how you might be thinking about framing a project to the public. Great. And thank then, you for your question. Yeah, and then I guess the follow-up with that, is there a is there any thought to, I did see the site selection, the site, the prioritization tool, and there's a whole bunch of, a whole bunch of factors, but is there any room to, or any conversation about figuring out waiting for those factors? So I did see that, is this a unique amenity um, was in that tool, but maybe I'm reading it wrong. Maybe I need to go back and read it, but it just looked like it was one of many, many factors where that's something where at least personally I'd give more weight to than I'd give to some of the other factors there. So has there been any conversation about weighting those factors, not just including them all? Thank you, Councillor, through the mayor. Uh, so this tool, uh, you know, we, we develop it in, in different ways and different manners for different communities. Um, and so in our, our conversations that we've had around this tool, our conversations that we had initially had um, previously about what the tool might look like and what elements might be captured in it, um, we were we had a whole host of different opportunities or different criteria and narrowed it down um, to the ones you see before you there. Uh, at the moment, we certainly have not had a, a conversation about waiting, but that is something that we can take back to administration and have a conversation with them about and how we would best approach that. Great. Thank you. Perfect. Councillor O'Connor. Thank you, Mary Clayton. Um, I, I'm just, I'm not sure if I've seen it, but I'm looking more at globally and a regional attraction uh, strategy. And if we don't list all the facilities that are in the area, uh, you know, it, it takes away from sport tourism. And, uh, and we need to be able to collaborate with our neighbors. So I think it's important that that is taken in. Is there any consideration for that at looking at all the facilities like the ball diamonds, you name it, there's a lot of facilities that are very close to the city. Thank you, Councillor, through the mayor. Uh, yes, so particularly in response to thinking about future investment and future site selection, we do apply a regional lens to those uh, frameworks and to those decision-making tools, uh, as well as part of our, the partnership elements of the document and uh, thinking through the sport tourism piece, as you mentioned, uh, we do recommend taking a regional lens and working with your partners to foster those opportunities and to ensure that the, the true breadth of, of opportunities and facilities that are available and are, are there to support those types of initiatives related to event hosting are captured and communicated. Um, and certainly that would be something when you look to develop an event hosting strategy that we would be recommending that you consider and ensure that you are speaking to the entire region and not just the city itself. Uh, but wonderful point, and thank you for that. Question for Director Gla or Mr. Glavin. Um, my recollection through um, through ICF as well as Grand Prairie Regional Rec uh, Invest Grand Prairie had a, a publication that pretty much encompassed all that in regards to facilities. Am, am I imagining that? Can you remind me? Thank you, Mary Clayton. I apologize. I just popped out. So I'm um, just piecing things together. I think you're talking about the hotels and then all the different facilities. Yeah, there was also offered. one for sport facility. If I, yeah, Ms. Yeah. Casualay, sorry, go, you probably know best. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so uh, Sport Development, Wellness and Culture has been working with Invest GP and in both of those uh, publications have recently been updated. So Perfect. yes, they are. And then um, just a bit to uh, Councillor O'Connor's point, um, all of the recreation amenities throughout the region are listed in the regional recreation. Right. In the master plan. And it would not include the cultural component, but yeah. um, certainly does list everything from a recreational perspective. Perfect. Thank you. Councillor Plot. Uh, thanks, Mayor Clayton. I guess I'm just wondering what next steps are with this. Um, I kind of probably had more questions for administration to see if there's things yeah. we want to get as outcomes. So I'm just wondering what the process on that is. Um, 
Mr. Lemieux or Ms. Cajolet, can you tell us your expectations of what's next? Thank you, uh, through the mayor. So um, we wanted to make sure that we discuss this uh, 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 process or this, uh, this report with council prior to the budget deliberations, uh, opening the door for uh, council to make any recommendations, anything they see, if they see any gaps that they want to discuss. We want to make sure that this was a public document uh, shared with council prior to budget. So we'll certainly be open to discussions at uh, budget. I guess to the CAO more um, concrete, sort of concretely, can you tell me if council has an idea, where do you want to see it? I don't want to see a, a barrage of hands going up during budget deliberation saying, hey, I want to add this, I want to add this, I want to add this. So. A very good uh, question, Madam Chair. And I, I think you're going to see, as a result of the strategy work that's been done to date, you should expect to see some suggestions coming forward from management. So we're interpreting the strategy as well. Uh, if council members would like something considered, uh, unless someone has a contrary view, I'm going to suggest get through uh, to Mr. Lemieux and have them included for consideration when this opens up at, at budget so that we've had a chance to assimilate them and can speak to them uh, uh, more thoroughly. Uh, otherwise, though, we will be prepared. Those are working sessions under budget, so if council members want to raise something during budget deliberations that they like to have considered by the whole council you're certainly at liberty to do that i recognize your uh, point on chaos though so thank you for that okay. all right uh so mr roma ms carey anything oh Councillor bressy of course <laughs> yeah no, i've actually got a motion i'd like to try but maybe it's best with staff you want to conclude question making but if Shh. Not no that's fine um i don't see anyone else in the queue so go for it yeah, um, and I would move that uh, uh, I would, and very much if you feel this will bring chaos, if there's a better process, our CEO would like him very open to withdrawing this motion. But um, I would I would move that committee direct administration to use the information gathered in this work to bring back a recommended site for an indoor climbing wall. And to speak to this, I think that what I saw as being part of the Re Regional Recreation Committee is coming up with strategies were great, but it was when we actually put a project through that we started to see where people stood and what tools worked and didn't work. And for, and we've said, hey, we're not going to talk about a climbing wall until we get this, until we get the support. And I don't think I want to wait months to start having that conversation. So my intention at budget, if nobody beats me to it, is to also bring forward a motion at budget that we actually fund a climbing wall. But I think part of that work is using the information we've gathered to figure out where that could go if council wants to get one built. Sorry, just give me one yeah. second. Okay, so I, I recognize a couple of councillors in the, in the queue. Um, I'm just asking if somebody can make a motion to go in camera. I have some further questions um, that I think will be relevant on councillor Bressy's motion. Sure, I'm happy to make that motion. Thanks. Yeah. So, uh, motion to go in camera. I'll give the Legislative Services Clerk a minute to catch up. If you could vote on that, please. <laughs> Councillor Bosch in favor. O'Toole. In favor. Bressy, O'Toole, Connor, everybody's in favor. All right. Thank you. Uh, I'll t you tell me when.
some business arising. Uh, Councillor Bressy. Yeah, th thank you, Mayor Clayton. So yeah, I'd like to keep my motion on the table to direct administration to use the information gathered in the strategy to bring back a recommended site for an indoor climbing wall. And just to speak to this, I think that there are many members of the community that would like to see climbing happen. I think there's potential partners of a whole variety of sorts that could help this help a facility be action in this community. And I think that there's there does need to be a place for it though. And we had a report that listed city facilities that could potentially host one. I'd like administration to do a little bit more work, um, both in terms of figuring out actual feasibility um, of different city facilities, but also using the data that we collect in the strategy to figure out where would a climbing wall not just be possible, but also be best served in our com community. Because I think that if we identify where one could go, then we can start working with partners to see can we actually make this happen for Grand Prairie. So I hope that council will support this motion. Thanks, Councillor Bressy. Would you be open to a friendly amendment to not only identify the location, but the type of climbing wall? Yes, thank you. That would be a really good amendment. Thank okay, you. Perfect. All right, any comments or questions on the motion? Seeing no one in the queue, I'll call the question. Councillor O'Toole? In favour. Councillor O'Connor? In favour. Perfect. Councillor Berg. That carries unanimously. Uh, other business arising. I think it would be, it would, uh, thanks Councillor Thiessen. Yeah, thank you, uh, Mayor Clayton. Just the business at hand, uh, we had the report uh, for this uh, recreation and culture strategy. So I just move that we receive it for information and Perfect. hopefully we'll put it to good use over the coming years. Perfect. Thank you for that. Comments or questions on that motion? Seeing none, I'll call the question. Councillor O'Connor? In favour. Councillor O'Toole, in favour. Councillor Berg? In favour. All right. And that carries unanimously. Now item number three on our council, on our council committee, the whole, if I could get somebody to make a motion to go in camera. Councillor Blackmore, thank you for that. Call the question. Councillor O'Connor? In favour. O'Toole? In favour. All right. And that carries unanimously. I'll give us a minute for administration.